Hello, everyone. Welcome to AI FISEC today. We're here at the first inaugural episode, and uh, I'm super excited for the host that we have today, or the guest that we have today, rather. Um, and uh, for those of you that don't know, what this podcast is meant to do is to embark on the thrilling journey into the intersection of artificial intelligence and the physical security industry. And, uh, and so we're super excited to have John Pauly on. Uh, John is the Chief Solutions Officer at Protect uh, Solutions. And uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about his background to start. Um, the topic that we're looking at today is what is and isn't AI, biometrics and AI, and also the EU AI Act. And then we'll wrap up to, to learn a little bit about what John's working on and then where you can find John. Um, out in the uh, out in the marketplace. So, John, welcome. Thank you for letting me have, be on this podcast. This is great. Yeah, love to have you, man. We're excited to hear. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, background, about your business, um, and we can jump right into it. Sure. So, I've been in the industry twenty two ish years now. I started out as a police officer. I have spent a vast majority of my career in uh, the integration world. And uh, five years ago, I started Protect Solutions Partners. We just celebrated a birthday on that one. Um, I was very happy to see that. Uh, and I am a security technology consultant. So lack of a better word, I get to geek out over technology and help other consultants and uh, end users figure out what the best solutions to meet their problems are. Um, I'd look at consulting a little bit different than others. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the consulting world is is big enough that we can all share. I like to think of us, yes, I'm a kid of the 80s, that we're all uh, Voltron lions. We come together, we form Voltron, save the world, and then break up and, and go do our own thing again until the next time. So um, that's how I've gotten to be here. Uh, and uh, I've gotten to, to do a few uh, uh, unique things along the way. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I got, I, uh, I get, I could, I could, uh, totally, um, agree with you on a lot of those things. So, so yeah. So, um, before we jump in, I'm just curious, maybe give us a one fun fact about you that, uh, you think your audience would love to know about you. Oh, gosh, one fun fact. Well, okay. So this is going to promote for ISC West coming up. Um, we, uh, myself and Chris Wilson, uh, last year presented a uh, wine and security event at IC West. We're going to do it again this year or this in 2024, it looks like. Uh, and it is not your, your typical uh, uh, happy hour. Um, it is, we're all about education and we love educating around uh, security and we love educating around wine. I'm actually uh, going for my WSET certifications now. Um, totally not security related certifications, but uh, we're going to do a, a a whole sommelier wine and security networking event at ISC West 2024. Uh, be on the lookout for some information coming with that. That's awesome. You heard it there for, uh, first, folks. I'm definitely going to be there. Um, love some wine and security. That sounds like the best two things ever if you're from the industry. Um, so yeah, so John, let's talk about, let's start off talking about what is and isn't AI. So what are your thoughts about that? So here's my thoughts. Just everybody has a thought of AI. Everybody says, you know, we've got this widget. We've got this thing. We can do whatever. The majority of those, the, the initial AI pieces that people are selling are a little bit more than Boolean uh, algebra, right? It, it's it's rules-based if-then statements. If Don walks in this store, right? Or a person in a white shirt walks in this store, then do this. That's not a, in my mind, that's not AI. That in the, in the scale of things, that's a little bit of computer vision technology because I'm identifying a color of a shirt, but that's really not giving me enough to consider AI. Now you add in deep learning neural networks um, and, and the the scale continues, but again, AI we have this continuum, and where do you fall on that? The problem is is that there's no 
tag that says my AI is not computer vision or is only computer vision. My AI is only this or my AI does that. Everybody has this statement of we have AI. Well, great. Then you dig into it and go, no, what you have is a rules-based engine that says that classified, it did not identify me, just classified a thing as a thing. And then you move to the next, uh, you, you classified it and then you move to the next thing. The, the ones I, I I think I look at now the most are when they look when the rules is it's a car or it's a vehicle or it's a person. If it's not either one of those, we don't train that, right? Again, there's a movie out there called The Core that reminds me they forgot to train something on empty space. And they're like, what is that? We didn't train the model of this. We have no idea. Oh, that's empty space. Oh, crud. Well, we're in the same boat. If the model's not trained on it, it doesn't know to classify it as a four-legged animal or something like that. If it's only looking at cars and people, we have a whole world out there that we missed. And that's where we get into some problems when we alert on the things that aren't car and people. But those are those may be a, a, an issue that we need to address. And that's not just within video surveillance, however, that works really well there it's also in access control what within facial biometrics other things what do we consider ai and access control and it's not just the endpoints um again those are is it rules based or is there a, an an actual artificial engine behind it and how do you feel that um you know when we think about whether it's rule based or artificial behind right the thought process of how these things work i mean how do you think that differences of that are impacting customers today so i'm not i'll say it like this i don't think that rules based is necessarily bad even though that previous little soapbox may have sounded like that rules based may fit certain customers there are certain customers that that's never going to work for what they're trying to do. And so my my pro, my statement has always been you know the right uh, the right product for the for the right use case. Um know what your client who your client is look, what they're looking for and if they're only looking for rules-based applications great that's that's going to fit into it. But if they're looking for something much bigger don't try to sell them a, 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 a rules-based system because it's not going to meet their needs. So um, again, as a consultant, I look at uh, not necessarily lines uh, of carrying a line card. I'm very much about, I want to have all the tools in my tool belt able to help whatever customer needs to be there, which means that it's, it's a very bespoke uh, solution and when you're dealing with AI, especially um, from a manufacturer side, you've got to be able to handle whatever that client is saying and, and be willing to say, you know something, we don't do this. And that's okay. What do you feel is the one of the biggest misconceptions of AI in our industry? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> there's probably a lot of them knowing us, right? We're like these there's... super paranoid people, uh, I guess. I think the answer is AI will do everything or anything, right? And there's a picture, um, and it, uh, in fact, I looked it up earlier today, um, of where the back end of a horse is this immaculately drawn, very much of an artist, and the front end is a stick figure, right? It's typically said, whichever, you know, what you want, what your buddy allows. The I would put that within an AI realm as well. What we what we think we're getting is this, you know, artist rendition, and what we've actually bought was the stick figure because it was sold as, lack of a better word, vaporware. And there is a a bit of that going on. I think that's I think that's there's a struggle there, um, you know. And and you know, a giving example in the biometric world. It, Department of Homeland Security runs a rally every year. I think this past one, they did 39 different biometrics. That includes iris scans, facial recognition, facial biometrics, 
uh, for access control. 39 companies, we have 500, over 500 companies, I think today have some sort of uh, um, facial recognition or facial identification analytic, but we've only done 39 um, this year. And so everybody else is self-certifying saying, my system is is 98% accurate. My system is 92% accurate, whatever. It's all self-certified. How do I trust that if I don't have anything to put it up against? Yeah, that's a good point. Because, I mean, who creates a standard, right? I mean, you have all these companies and manufacturers that are looking at it, whether internal internally for operations improvements or or for their end customer. And you know, the aspect of, of what they're getting is we don't know. We don't know what the foundation model they're using. Are they using open AI that has some bias? Uh, who's checking that? Where's that information security white paper at that shows the underlying, the underbelly of the artificial intelligence? Or is that buzzword just going to be continued to be u- loosely used and, you know, and not not get checked on. What do you think? I I think that's going to be one of the concerns, right? There are already companies that are using OpenAI to build their they're using OpenAI to uh, and ChatGPT to do their coding. There's a lot of companies that just like they OEM camera parts, they're going to OEM camera analytics or algorithms. It's already being done today. Uh, and we're not even just talking camera analytics for uh, algorithms. We're talking biometri- biometrics, access control, the uh, across our, in- our industry. When you don't know what that base programming is, um, let's say that company X uh, program their, did their, pro- their, their coding using chat GPT, right? It pulled open source code. Well, Give an example, back Christmas two years ago, Log4j was a huge ransomware attack because it pulled one little piece of an open source code out of every switch on the face of the earth. Cisco goes down, IBM goes down, all these other companies go down because of that one little piece of code was hacked because it was open source. But no one knew that that was open source because it was pulled from all these other manufacturers. We have the risk of that as well, and and that's just one avenue. Um, you know, the other thing that I think you're going to see with, especially as we deal with AI, uh, and again, I'm going to punt towards biometrics on this, but not not always, is that um, there is um, there's there's really no set training metrics, right? I've talked to companies, they say, give us two weeks and we can we can have your, whatever you want us to do, we can learn the model in two weeks. We just need one or two pictures of what you're looking for and we train it on that one or two pictures 10,000 times. Right, it's looking for one or two pictures, right? Your sample size is small. Not to blast anybody on that, but that's, it's a very custom built analytic. Um, I think where the industry is going to have to go or or get to is, there's going to have to be a standard accepted. Here's your base model. If you're doing, let's say you're doing facial biometrics, and I'm not saying again, this is a is a. I'm taking a sampling size of of all of them, but it could be expanded to other things. But let's say facial biometrics. We know that there's bias there, or at least there's issues around bias with facial biometrics. So somebody's going to have to come up with a. Whether that be you know DHS, NIST, uh, SIA, um, whoever is going to have to come up with this database that says here's a hundred thousand faces, here's ten million faces of every shape, color, size, all this. You have to use this as your base. Now you have to build your secret sauce on top of this, and you can have your own models in there, but you have to include this as your minimally viable standard product. And I think that's where, especially where things are probably going to have to head. I don't think we're there yet, but I think there's enough um, doubt and enough public public opinion that's driving a lot of this stuff. Um, it's going to it's going to affect how our industry has to has to accept it. 
Yeah, that's it's interesting to see like how people, you know, like you said, like what standards will come across because every industry is it, it being affected here, right? And, and like, how do they even control that? You know, this isn't OSDP. This isn't, uh, you know, something within our little industry that that SIA can sit down at a board and say, okay, here's what we're going to do, uh, you know, like as easily at least, right? And so, right. you know, and so what's happened in the past, like to my understanding, maybe to back it up a little bit. So AI in itself is such a loose term, but it's like what type of AI you've got under AI, one layer is machine learning. So within machine learning for the audiences, you have all kinds of foundation machine learning models, regression models and uh, classification models and all these things. And the idea to what John was saying was you you could classify a dog as a dog by giving it a bunch of images of dogs, but where does it start to think more, right? And so you start to go down a layer of beyond that, which is deep learning. And that's what's catalyst has happened with chat GBT. Um, I probably every podcast chat GBT is going to come up by the way. So I'm just giving <laughs> everyone's head. It's up because that's the one I think that, that highlighted how powerful this stuff can be. And so now, like we talked about just a minute ago, you incorporate open AI as a foundation model. You know, what does that mean? What does that mean for the security industry? So, so John, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about uh, biometrics and AI, anything you haven't told us about and uh, maybe how you think, what sort of foundation models you think they might accept or, or anything else around that topic. Sure. I'll, I, I, but I want to add one thing. And, you know, we're so everybody's aware we are not to we're not to Skynet yet. We're not sentient. It's uh, I just got finished watching The Matrix with my kids. Like we're not there. Um, I don't think that we're as close there as maybe. I, I just don't think we're we're that's a fear yet. That may be a fear in my kids or grandkids lifetime, but I don't think we're there yet now we may have some some humanoid robots that look kind of creepy but we're not to uh to that piece yet so i don't want to fear monger and say this is you know sentience is around the corner i don't think we're i don't think we're quite there um but we have innovated we've innovated faster in the last 10 years than we've innovated in the last 100 years right we've innovated in the last five years faster than we've innovated in the last, you know, 10 years before that, probably by four times, right? Um, so, you know, the thing about biometrics, so to jump into that, um, is a, there's a couple of different ways of looking at, it, right? There's facial biometrics, um, there's face matching, facial recognition, and facial authentication in those terms. And then there's other authentications. And so, um, and I, I put out a, an article with uh, Don Zufall for uh, the Azure Emerging Tech Group around what is facial biometrics, because our industry, I don't think our industry as a whole, from security directors, from, uh, you know, manufacturers know what they put out, but from the integrator side standpoint, the end user standpoint, I don't think they really have a concept uh, Overall, I think some individuals do of what it looks, what this means. So face matching is, you know, forensically searched. We're looking at, you know, one looking for one face in ten thousand, right? Facial recognition is what we're getting. That's what the news is all hitting now. Going, oh my gosh, this is horrible. And it has been used in some ways for that. What's funny to me is that one of the selling points for an iPhone and now for an Android is I can unlock my phone with my face. Guess what? You just use facial biometrics, facial recognition to open your phone. You gave away that opportunity that your, your security, your, your PII to Apple to be able to do that. Um, now that's looking, but facial recognition is looking for a, uh, uh, one face or or scanning many scanning one face for the crowd right i'm looking for a person inside this in this crowd versus i'm scanning the crowd looking for one face um and then your your facial uh authentication 
that is that one in 100,000, one in 10 million kind of application where I'm using my face as access control. Again, in the iPhone scenario, it's one-to-one. -one. There is only one John opening that iPhone, except I don't do the one button click. So there you go. Um, but looking at how do I use biometrics for, for authenticating me as I walk into a building? Now we've had uh, since COVID, we've we've had this push for frictionless, this push to get people in the building faster because they can be more productive. So instead of fumbling around with a badge or even a phone for mobile access, which is uh, obviously here, it's using a biometric allows us to get in the building without ever having to find a credential, and we can move forward. Now, it's funny I speak on biometrics and I, I, I you know and I hold my PII very close to the vest, if you will. But we're using, you know, biometrics can be used for, um, you know, vein detection uh, with aliveness, facial detection, gait detection, voice uh, voice biometrics. There's a number of those, and they all have different features, and every company has a different version of what it, what it does is accuracy, accuracy, all that. One of the things I want to mention about biometric AI is, um, that you've got to be careful where you use it. There has to be a policy around how you use it, um, what all of that. Um, so Illinois has the Biometric Information Protection Act, otherwise known as BIPA. That is a gold standard in terms of what we're looking, you know, what you have to do. Um, Texas has the QB standard, right? Um, we've already seen uh We've already seen things like uh, um, White Castle that is currently in the billions of dollars fine because, and this isn't just for White Castle everywhere, just in Illinois for the for the employees that they had in Illinois for the past five years, every time they used their finger to log into the computer, that was a biometric signature and it was a fine of $1,000 per instance. They're at like thirteen point seven billion dollars is their current fine on a on a company that's a two hundred forty million dollar company on any given day. Are you talking um, about the White Castle, the cheeseburger place? So we're talking about White Castle, the cheeseburger place. It's a lot of cheeseburgers. Yeah, that's a lot of cheeseburgers. And yeah. so you know, it's Bipa's not just going after the Facebooks and the Googles and the and the Clearviews. Here was a here was a company who had a policy for. We're going to use a fingerprint to log into the computer because it's friction, somewhat frictionless and it's a lot easier than typing out a password, right? But they didn't handle the data correctly. Um, and so, I, you know, that's really something to think about um, with uh, specifically with BIFA. And I'm, give me one second. I'm, I wanted to, um, uh, I had a note on that actually. Um, the the thing about BIPA though is, and and again, Texas has one that's that's related to it. Um, it is all about how do you collect the, the biometric signature, the retention of the biometric signature, how do you disclose what you're doing, and the destruction of it. The simple ways are, you know, you've got an opt-in. If somebody wants maybe it's it's a matter of their employment they have to but they have to opt in they don't have to work there you're not holding a gun to their head but if you don't have that opt in and you say this is our new policy well you now you're liable if you hold that data for longer than uh, one year after they've after they've left and can be lower uh, upwards of 30 days you're in violation and so a lot of companies have if they're doing uh, selling in Illinois doing things in Illinois, they're not doing biometrics in Illinois. They're not taking the chance because of that. And I, so biometric AI is one thing, but there's a whole piece to that because there's a number of states that are adopting BIPA, BIPA style laws uh, across the US. And even um, to that point, there's, while states may not be adopting it, you're seeing, um, uh, even cities adopting it. Uh, there was one a couple uh, a couple years back that was put forward um, that uh, you couldn't have, you couldn't use your face to unlock your car. Well, somebody had something against Tesla because that's the only car you could unlock with your face at the time. 
Um, you couldn't use facial recognition on your baby monitors. You couldn't use facial recognition on all these inside the house products. My question has always been, how are you going to enforce that? Unless an officer walks into your house or sees you start your Tesla with your face, like how is he going to tell what you've been doing? But it got passed as a law. So those legal pieces are what's driving a lot of the biometric adoption. So, John, we got less than a minute. I know we didn't get to the EU AI Act, but maybe that'll be a podcast for another day. Tell us where people can find you next. Um, I think you're going to be at GSX and uh, what you're working on and and uh, close us up. Take us home. Sure. So I will be at GSX. Um, look for me. I uh, actually arriving early and leaving uh, uh, leaving on Wednesday, I think, at this point. Um, I am. You can find me on at ProtechSolutionsPartners.com. Uh, you can find I write an article for Security Business Magazine called Tech Trends every other month. So the the next one coming out is going to be in October. So look for that around the middle of the month when the when the magazine drops. Um, and uh, there's a couple of uh, speaking engagements that are in the works. So uh, uh, come find me where. Uh, uh,